Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's July 19th. Today, we celebrate the decoupage botanical artist that left her mark on botanical history. We'll also learn about a Louisiana botanist, naturalist, and author who lived in a home called Briarwood. We'll salute the English poet who was killed in World War I. He appreciated the pure beauty of flowers. And we'll also recognize one of Canada's leading botanists. He was 90 years old when he died on this day 100 years ago. And we'll honor July with a beautiful poem called Keeping July. We grow that garden library with a book that inspires kids to cook with their garden harvest, and it's part of the best-selling American Girl cooking series. And then we'll wrap things up with the landscape architect who fought to have a tree instead of a parking meter in front of his office building. But first, let's catch up on some greetings from gardeners from around the world and today's curated news. Well, I have to start out by sharing something that Mary Beth Hughes shared in the Facebook group for the show over in the Daily Gardener community. And it was this wonderful idea that someone had to put a stand up in their neighborhood that people could use as a plant swap. This is just a simple shelf that they painted purple. And across the top, it says, need a plant, take a plant. And then on the next row, it says, have a plant, leaf a plant. I love that they made it into a pun, leaf a plant, instead of leave a plant. In any case, what a fantastic idea, a place for people to have a safe plant swap in their neighborhood. And it was so well done, and it really brings a smile. So if you haven't seen it yet, in the Facebook group for the show, you should head on over and check it out. It's really an inspiring image. So thank you, Mary Beth, for sharing that with the group. And then in addition to that great share, I asked the community a question. What plant, tree, or shrub is out of place in your garden, and how many years have you been meaning to move it? Well, I decided I would go first. Here at the cabin, we are going on two plus years of having this panicle hydrangea that's in front of the porch at the cabin. And right about this time of year, it starts to drive me crazy because it is way too big. But then, of course, it starts to bloom like it's doing right now. And I feel bad for it. And I relent and I let it do its thing. And then, of course, by fall, I'm just too tired to go out there and move it. But it must get moved this year. And I love that Patricia replied to me and she said, October, you have a date with a shovel then. And that is very true. This fall, I'm going to have to redo a lot of the shrubs in front of the porch. We're getting new siding put on and we're also adding a set of stairs And that's going to result in a small redo project of the shrubs that are up by the front porch. Julia McMurdy replied that she has a limelight hydrangea that needs to be moved. And Amber Thomas said that she's been meaning to move a white lilac for three years. She writes, it's in my garden bed in front of the house, and I didn't plant it there, but year over year, we don't move it when we keep saying we will. Claudia Hepler has some boxwood that she said her husband won't let her move, but they're way too big, and then he shapes them, and she just feels they're too formal. And then Jen McGinnis said that she has two rhododendrons, but she did move a hydrangea earlier this year, and that took all the stuffing out of her, so she's not as motivated anymore to move those roadies. And then finally, Kathy Brown wrote, so many things I need to move. I bought the house 20 years ago, bought and planted randomly in ignorance, and now I see that the sunny lovers are in the shade, and the shade lovers are are in full sun. Well, I hope that all of these responses help you realize that you're not alone if you have something that is just out of place in your garden and it's been a chronic problem. But I also have to say that as I read through all of these responses, I found it very inspiring to finally take action this year. And I hope you find that same inspiration. 
The sooner we move these things, the more we can enjoy them in their proper home in our gardens. And you know, sometimes it helps to calendarize these things. And of course, the best time to move shrubs or perennials is in the fall. So set aside some time, maybe the last week of September, early October, and put a date on the calendar. And I'm confident that the only thing we'll regret is not doing it, pushing these tasks off one more year. So let's not, and we can say that it's something productive we accomplished in our 2020 gardens. And before I forget, I want to make sure to welcome the new members to our Facebook group, the Daily Gardener Community. Let's welcome Agatha Mills DeBoer, Garrick Passini, Lynn Dirk, Jeff Bysouth, Mary Nagel Klein, Miranda Pareda, L.P. Alvarez, Sam Ayala, and Robin Smith Brannan. Welcome, you guys. Now, just a reminder that if you'd like to participate in the Gardener Greeting segment, all you have to do is share your pics, stories, birthday wishes, and so forth in the Facebook group for the show, or email them to me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. That's jennifer at thedailygardener.org. And to listen to the show while you're at home, don't forget that you can just ask Alexa or Google to play the Daily Gardener podcast. It's just that easy to play the show on your smart speaker. Here's today's curated news. Well, earlier in the month, I saw a wonderful post that was written by Paul Hervey Brooks, and it was simply titled, Anne Marie Powell Talks Lockdown and Sharing Her Garden. This post is about a gardener named Anne Marie Powell, and the popularity of her daily Instagram live posts from her garden is incredible. And according to Anne Marie, it's simply astonishing. Here's an excerpt from Paul's post. Begun on day one of lockdown and broadcast every day since then, My Real Garden account on Instagram has more than 9,500 followers, making it more successful than Anne Marie's official design Instagram feed. In fact, it's become such a part of her life that she's planning to keep it even as lockdown eases. Anne Marie turned a corner of her garden into a studio, and the award winning designer started the My Real Garden feed after being inundated with requests for gardening advice as Britain went into lockdown. Anne Marie said, My garden was literally full of weeds because it hadn't been looked after for two years. I like to be doing, so I thought, it'll motivate me. It'll be a bit of a diary, and if I put it out there, I've got to do it. And then she said, I didn't realize that so many people would be interested. Well, Anne Marie's My Real Garden had its 100th consecutive broadcast on July 1st, and at that point, it turned into two times a week instead of a daily event. But you can follow Anne Marie's My Real Garden on Instagram Live. And she's got a fun event planned for Wednesdays. She's calling them Wine and Water Wednesdays, when followers will join her to water their gardens with a glass of wine in their hand. Now, you can follow Anne Marie on Instagram at My Real Garden. And there's also plenty of information on her website. And if you'd like to read this post for yourself in the Facebook group for the show, just search for Anne Marie, that's Anne hyphen Marie, and this post will pop up. Now, over at the blog, I wrote a quick little post called, What's the Difference Between Oregano and Marjoram? And I'll read you a quick little excerpt. If you've grown both oregano and marjoram, you know that they look quite similar, and they're often confused for one another. But when it comes to flavor and taste, it's easy to tell them apart. Oregano tends to be earthy, pungent, and spicy. It can easily overpower the other flavors in a dish. And to subdue the pungency, cooks recommend using the dried form of oregano. 
On the other hand, marjoram is milder, and you can use that alliteration to help you remember mild marjoram. Marjoram's flavor is definitely more refined than oregano's. It's floral and woodsy, and because it's sweeter and milder, chefs recommend using fresh marjoram instead of dried marjoram for cooking. So again, just to recap, if you're cooking with oregano, use the dried form of oregano. And if you're cooking with marjoram, use fresh. All right, that's it for today's gardening news. Now, if you'd like to check out my curated news articles and original blog posts for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group for the show. It's called the Daily Gardener Community. So there's no need to take notes or search for links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for the Daily Gardener Community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. It was on this day in 1744 that the botanical tissue paper decoupage artist Mary Delaney wrote to her sister about her garden. Mary Delaney had an extraordinary life. Her family had forced her to marry a 60-year-old man when she was 17. He was an alcoholic, and to make matters worse, when he died, he forgot to include her in his will. Despite her lack of inheritance, Mary realized that she had much more freedom after he died than she had as a single young lady. In society, as a widow, she could do as she pleased. Fate brought fortune for Mary when love came knocking on her door in June of 1743. That day, Mary met an Irish doctor named Patrick Delaney, and he was also a pastor. Although her family wasn't thrilled with the idea of a second marriage to the son of a servant, Mary did it anyway. She and Patrick moved to his home in Dublin and his garden was a thing of beauty, and that's why on this day, Mary wrote to her sister. She said, The fields are planted in a wild way, forest trees and bushes that look so natural, you would not imagine it a work of art. There is a very good kitchen garden and two fruit gardens, which will afford us a sufficient quantity of everything we can want. And there are several prettinesses that I can't explain to you. Little wild walks, private seats, and lovely prospects. One seat I am particularly fond of is in a nut grove, and there is a seat in a rock that is placed at the end of a cunning wild path and the brook entertains you with a purling rill. Mary and Patrick were happily married for 25 years. And when Patrick died, Mary was widowed again, this time at the age of 68. But Mary's life was not over. At that point in time, she hit it off with Margaret Bentinck, Bentinck was the Duchess of Portland, and together they pursued botanical activities. They loved to go out into the fields and collect specimens together. And it was thanks to the Duchess that Mary got to know Joseph Banks and Daniel Solander. When Mary was in her early 70s, she took up decoupage, which was all the rage at the time. And then she began creating marvelous depictions of flowers. Today, historians believe that Mary probably dissected plants to create her art. Botanists from all over Europe would send her specimens. King George III and Queen Charlotte were her patrons. They ordered any curious or beautiful plant to be sent to Mary Delaney so that she could use them to create her art. Her paper mosaics, as Mary called them, were made out of tissue paper, and she created almost a thousand pieces of art between the ages of 71 and 88. 
And if you ever see any of her most spectacular decoupage pieces, you'll be blown away at the thought of them being made from tiny pieces of tissue paper by Mary Delaney in the twilight of her life in the late 1700s. And today is the birthday of the naturalist, botanist, ornithologist, prize-winning horticulturist, painter, archaeologist, historian, author of six books, and a proud daughter of the great state of Louisiana, Carolyn Dorman, who was born on this day in 1888. Her friends called her Carrie. Carrie was a tiny woman, and she was also a powerhouse, forming her own opinions and ideas about the natural world. A traditionalist, Carrie always wore dresses. She thought pants were quite scandalous. Carrie was born at her family's summer home called Briarwood. It would become her forever home and a national treasure. In the 1920s, Carrie built a writing cabin at Briarwood, and she called it Three Pines because of the trio of tall pine trees around it. Carrie told her friends it was a place for daydreams. By the 1950s, a second cabin was built at Briarwood. Carrie liked to take the screens off the windows every spring so that the wrens could build nests inside. At Briarwood, Carrie installed trails through the woods, and she planted hundreds of plants. She even installed a reflecting pool for Grandpappy, her name for her favorite tree on the property. Grandpappy is estimated to be over 300 years old. A longleaf pine, he's still alive today. And I thought you'd enjoy a story about Grandpappy that Carrie used to share with visitors. Once a forester came by, and he wanted to core Grandpappy to determine a more exact age for the tree. Well, you can about imagine what happened. Carrie stopped him in his tracks and said, It's none of your business how old Grandpappy is, or how old I am, for that matter. And that's quintessentially Carrie Dorman, a.k.a. the Queen of the Forest Kingdom. And today is the birthday of the World War I English poet Leslie Coulson, who was born on this day in 1889 and who was killed in action at the Battle of Le Transloy in France. Coulson wrote, The gold stocks hide bodies of men who died, charging at dawn through the dew to be killed or to kill. I thank the gods that the flowers are beautiful still. And today is the hundredth anniversary of the death of one of the and today is the hundredth anniversary of the death of one of Canada's leading botanists, John McCown, who died on this day in 1920. He was 90 years old when he died. And here's a little story McCown shared about growing up in Ireland. We had a garden well fenced in. My mom encouraged us to spend our idle time in it. I seem to prefer taking an old knife and going out to the fields, digging up flowers and bringing them in, and making a flower garden of my own. I only remember primroses and the wild hyacinth. Another characteristic was the power of seeing. I could find more strawberries and more bird's nests than any other boy. After arriving in Canada, McCown had started out as a farmer. In 1856, he became a school teacher, partly to nourish his nearly obsessive interest in botany, but also to find a more balanced life. McCown wrote that before teaching, quote, I had never had more than one holiday in the year, and that was Christmas Day. My brother Frederick and I might take a day's fishing in the summer, 
but an eight-mile walk and scrambling along the river was not very restful. Within five years, McCown had begun a regular correspondence with prominent botanists like Asa Gray and Sir William Hooker. In McCown's autobiography, there are many touching passages about his love of botany. Here is a little glimpse into how he cultivated his understanding of plants. He wrote, I would take a common species of roadside or garden plant, of which I knew the name, and then immediately endeavor to work out its correct name from the classification. The mullen was the species that I took first. I found it more difficult than I had thought on account of its long and short stamens. But I soon came to understand the arrangement of the stamens and pistils so well that most plants could be classified by their form alone. And there's a funny story about McCown. One time he was approached by his future father-in-law, Simon Terrell, who was a little skeptical of McCown's prospects. And McCown wrote about it in his autobiography, saying, Simon Terrell who was a well-known Quaker in that district, found me with a plant in my hand and said, John, what dost thee ever expect to make out of the study of botany? Well, I told him that I did not know, but that it gave me a great deal of pleasure. In unearthed words, today's poem is from the Irish writer and poet Joanna O'Sullivan, who gave me permission to share her poem called Keeping July. Dens of chairs and blankets, a circus show at home, lines and nets and rackets, no one keeping score, eight books each to represent a fox in socks surveys. On July 1st, the power went, and the movie was delayed. Calves the very height of style, in all their sepia glory. Starlings at the seaside, taking inventory. Lettuce growing rivalry, in green and purple lines. Questions answered silently learning to tell time. Rapunzel can no longer hide. Rooster calling on repeat. Gorse clicks and crackles from all sides. A 90s dance floor beat. Chippings, pavers, rollers. Our road consolidated. Filling, tearing smokers keep children fascinated. A linnet pair on seedy heads, thrushes gobbling berries, an old pink paper license explaining pounds and pennies. Old heads of lavender on thin but sturdy stalks. We edge through the calendar these days, not to recall. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book. Garden to Table by the Williams Sonoma Test Kitchen. This book came out in 2018, and it's part of the best selling American Girl cooking series. And the subtitle is Fresh Recipes to Cook and Share. This book is a perfect gift for the young gardener in your life. It features recipes from six categories of garden harvests, veggies, herbs, berries, fruits, root vegetables and gourds, and citrus. And this book is 144 pages of over 50 recipes for kid-friendly dishes highlighting seasonal ingredients from the garden. You can get a copy of Garden to Table by the Williams Sonoma Test Kitchen and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $9. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. 
Today is the birthday of the landscape architect Robert Fenton, who was born on this day in 1933. Robert was a Harvard grad, and he settled down in Pennsylvania. And while I was researching Fenton, it was impossible to avoid all of the newspaper articles that covered a disagreement that he had with the city of Pittsburgh. In 1965, Robert was a young 32-year-old landscape architect with an office at 6010 Center Avenue. Newspaper accounts said he had wanted to spruce up what he called a drab neighborhood in the East Liberty section. After trying for weeks to get permission to plant a tree in front of his building from the city forester Earl Blankenship, Robert decided it was better to ask forgiveness and went ahead with the planting. Robert told reporters that planting the tree was in line with President Johnson's thinking on beautification and that, quote, if you try to get anything done through the city, you get no, no, no. So we decided to break up the sidewalk and put it in, hoping no one would notice. Unfortunately, the installation accidentally took out a parking meter. Newspaper accounts shared that, in the dead of night, Robert brought in a high lift, a 15-ton truck, and five men. The tree he selected was a beauteous 25-foot ash with a 5-inch base, and it cost Robert $110 back in 1965. And the total project cost Robert $275. Well, the city took umbrage at Robert's actions, and after two weeks of discussions, the city attorney, David Stahl, said the tree was cut down and hauled away by city forester Earl Blankenship in the middle of the night. Robert came to work and was shocked to discover the tree gone, cut to the ground. Just days earlier, he had told reporters that, I think it's going to be so difficult to remove the tree that the city will let it stay and merely warn me not to let it happen again. Well, he couldn't have been more wrong. And I have to say, newspaper accounts of this story were super punny. Here's a sampling. Tree goes, city barks. Citizen on a limb. Poetic tale of a tree somehow lacks meter. A tree grew in violation. Woodmen spare that tree. Cry of architect falls on deaf ears. City thinks meter lovelier than a tree. Want meter there and no shady deal. Now, today... 55 years later, if you look up Robert's office building on Google Earth, what do you know? There's a tree growing in front of the building. But guess what? There's no parking meter. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Bierbaum, Kiana Raley, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram. And listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.